Well, 70 years ago, in May 1948, the United States, among others, recognised the State of Israel. But while they recognised the right of the resuscitated nation to exist, one administration after another refused to recognise Jerusalem as the Jewish capital. And the Israeli Prime Minister, Mr Netanyahu, he, this is what he constantly maintains. He says, Jerusalem is our capital. We will continue to build there and additional embassies will move to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, he says, is the capital of Israel. Whether or not the United Nations recognises this. It took 70 years for the United States to formally recognise this and it will take years for the UN to do the same. And now, in addition to this, the American President, Mr Trump, as you probably know from your news, recently announced that the United States will acknowledge that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. And considering the Jewish people's indestructible bond to Jerusalem goes back more than 3,000 years. Because it was there in Jerusalem, when it was known simply as Salem, on Mount Moriah that Abraham offered his son Isaac and was credited with righteousness for his faith in God. And later, after vanquishing a horde of foreign invaders from the north in a what was a daring and lightning raid to rescue prisoners of war, including his nephew Lot, Abraham then enjoyed a fellowship meal of bread and wine outside Salem with a king, Melchizedek, the king priest of Salem. It was also in Jerusalem that King David consecrated the capital of the Kingdom of Israel after capturing the city of Jebus, which Salem came to be called, from the Jebusites. He captured this when his elite troops climbed a hidden conduit and gained entrance to the city. Since its rebirth in 1948, the modern state of Israel has placed the Neset, the seat of parliament, its democratic assembly within Jerusalem. But now with America's stand for Israel, America has put a cat among the proverbial pigeons by boldly announcing that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. Mr Trump has instructed his State Department to move the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And the US administration fully intend to advance their plan to open the United States Embassy in Jerusalem within the next two years. Now the US President is said to have made his decision in the best interests of peace. By finally recognising Jerusalem as Israel's capital, the United States say they have chosen fact over fiction, which they affirm is the only true foundation for a just and lasting peace. But what do the Palestinians think about this? What's their view? Well, they view Mr Trump's decision to recognise Jerusalem as the capital of Israel as the slap of the century. And the US stand on Jerusalem has angered not only the Palestinians, but most member countries of the United Nations have likewise had their feathers ruffled. And two months ago, the UN General Assembly, they had a vote, and they voted by a huge majority to reject America's formal recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. 128 members voted in favour of the resolution, supporting the long-standing international consensus that the status of Jerusalem, which is claimed as a capital by both Israel and the Palestinians, can only be settled as an agreed final issue in a peace deal. But there were only nine states, including the US and Israel, that voted against that resolution. 22 of the 28 EU countries voted for the resolution, including the UK and France. Germany, which in the past has abstained on measures relating to Israel, they also voted in favour. It wasn't Israel or anyone's decision, it was an international consensus that was required. 35 countries abstained, including five EU states and other US allies, including Australia, Canada, Colombia and Mexico. And ambassadors from a slew of abstaining countries use their airtime on the podium to berate America's recognition for Jerusalem as the Jewish capital. The resolution that was co-sponsored by Yemen and Turkey called Trump's recognition null and void and reaffirmed 10 Security Council resolutions on Jerusalem dating back to 1967, 
including requirements that the city's final status must be decided in direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. And the resolution also demands that all states comply with Security Council resolutions regarding the Holy City of Jerusalem and not to recognise any actions or measures contrary to those resolutions. But when men speak of Jerusalem, depending on their religious or political persuasion, it is always with passion. Major world religions, Judaism, Catholicism and Islam, along with a host of lesser known religions, all call Jerusalem home. They all claim Jerusalem as their holy city, their sacred site. Now, I've walked the narrow alleys and streets of old Jerusalem, squeezing among the jostling crowds of the Damascus Gate markets, full of Arab stallholders loudly hawking their bagels and their bananas. I've descended down the steep, narrow stairways to wade through knee-high cold water deep under the city to explore the waterway dug by King Hezekiah's men to assure a water supply against an impending Assyrian siege of Jerusalem. I've also walked on the Temple Mount and explored the gullies and the ridges around Jerusalem, and I'm sure that some of you in this audience too have done likewise. I've climbed the stairs to the Haram al-Sharif precinct and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. I've stood on the rooftops of the old city of Jerusalem and watched the sun rise over the domes and spires of the churches, of the mosques and the synagogues, all the while serenaded by the clanging of church bells. And in a tight thoroughfare, I've been almost bowled over by a fervent formation of, of Hasidic Orthodox Jews with their tightly curled side locks, their black suits and their hats and their shoes, all marching in lockstep to the wailing wall for their prayers. I've also experienced the generosity and hospitality of both Muslim and Christian Arabs within that city and elsewhere in the Middle East. So the question, Jerusalem, whose capital? It's a very thorny question, isn't it, for leaders of the world, both political and religious. Yet it need not be so if they would only turn to the Bible. So we want to look at Jerusalem from God's point of view. And before we endeavour to prove the statement posed by our title tonight, the Bible tells us whose capital Jerusalem will be, I want to lay some groundwork on the ancient city itself from God's perspective. Now, since we all have access to a Bible in this room tonight, let, let's turn to it, shall we? Let's look again to the reading that Bill read for us uh, tonight. And, and just think about it for a moment. Could you say that the subject of God's choice of Jerusalem as a special place was ambiguous from our reading? Because as we followed along with our chairman, how many times did Jerusalem occur in just 21 verses? Well, I counted six in verse 12, in verse 14, twice in verse 16, verse 17, and verse 19. Let's read again 14 to 17. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy, and I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Is God's intent with Jerusalem ambiguous? Or unclear? Well, it's not, is it? Not at all. God is jealous for Jerusalem. For Zion, he says, with great jealousy. The, these are passionate words, aren't they, of intense feeling and heat. And, you know, just in case we miss the point of God's feelings toward Jerusalem, he explains them again to the prophet Zechariah in chapter 8. At chapter 8, at verse 2 and 3, and God's emotions toward the city of Jerusalem run high and they run hot. Jealous with great jealousy. Let's read that. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 8 verse 2. I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, 
I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Now, why is God so jealous and protective of Jerusalem? Why so much heat? And why does God care about Jerusalem anyway? Surely he's got more important things to do superintending the universe. Why would God, the Lord God of hosts, be so concerned with the dust and the stones of a tiny dot of a city on this earth and the people who inhabit it? Why all this raw emotion, this jealousy about this city, Jerusalem? Well, in Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 8, we read these words. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, as hard as a rock, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it came to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them that no man passed through nor returned, for they lay the pleasant land desolate. See, God chose the Jewish people to be unique, to be special and to represent him because he made promises to their ancestors for their faith in him. And God expected a set of behaviours, it was only fair, wasn't it, from his people, but they willfully set them aside. And what's the context of this set of verses we've just read from chapter 7? Well, the Jews are actually in exile in Persia for their rebellion against their God. His patience with their sins has run dry, and so he deploys the proud Babylonians who evict the Jews from their beloved city as we might sweep scrapes from our dinner plate into the bin. But, you know, the predicted eviction meant 70 years of banishment until another king came along, a king called Cyrus, and he was the Persian monarch, and he made this amazing decree. He decreed that the Jews were free to return and rebuild. And this is his decree, and it's found in Ezra 1, verse 2 to 4, if you're taking notes or if you want to turn it up. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? This is quite an astonishing de decree to people who are, who, who are your captives. He is allowing them to go free. God, his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the freewill offering for the house of God that's in Jerusalem. So Cyrus, the Persian monarch, acknowledges and expresses four critical facts about the Lord God and about Jerusalem. One, the Lord God of heaven is the one who has granted me authority over all earthly kingdoms. He was not in any doubt about that. Two, it is by God's commandment that I have the responsibility to lead construction of a house for God. This house will be constructed in Jerusalem, in the land of Judah. And fourthly, it will be the house of the Lord God of Israel in Jerusalem. So the monarch of one of the greatest empires in world history was not in any doubt about his position or mission in relation to the Lord God of heaven. There was zero confusion, wasn't there? Or questions on his association with Jerusalem in Judah, the land of the Jews. Now, that the Jews did return and rebuild their temple as Cyrus decreed, despite fierce local opposition, it's a well-known fact. Ultimately, we know the Romans came and squashed the second temple that Herod had embellished with massive and precious stones and gold. 
and banish the citizens of Jerusalem, forbidding them ever to return. And then after the Byzantine era of Constantine fame, the Crusaders came. But they were booted from the Holy Land and they lost Jerusalem to the Mameluk Turks in 1187. And the Mameluk, Mameluk Turks rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem virtually faded away from the consciousness of the world. And it's only in the last 150 years or so that the stage has been set for the rediscovery of the political and strategic importance of the so-called holy city and for a renewal of the love affair of the Western world with Jerusalem. And Russian, German and other European nations have jostled for a presence in the ownership and the control of Jerusalem. And they've built monumental complexes in their own unique style and have decorated these structures within and without with millions of dollars worth of gold plating and expensive artworks and priceless treasures. And the old city still maintains four quarters, Jewish, Christian, Muslim and Armenian. So what we've been reading this, this in Zechariah, this script for a revival for the city of Jerusalem and a return for the Jewish people to the ancient land of Israel is a biblical imperative. And in Zechariah 8 and verse 4, here's a change of fortune for the city. Zechariah 8 and verse 4, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If it be marvellous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvellous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. It's a very hopeful picture painted for us by the prophet. It's not now, though there are streets full of people playing, but it's talking about a wonderful future time of peace. Jerusalem is not known on our news broadcast, is it, for a lot of peace. If you take the whole Bible and count the word Jerusalem, you'll find it occurs well over 800 times. In fact, you'll discover that the Bible is all about Jerusalem. And so too is this prophecy of Zechariah that we're reading from this evening. Because these prophecies were designed to do three things. They were designed to remind the nation of Israel of the Lord God's love for them. They were, to, they, they were designed to criticise them for their sins and the need to change their attitude. And thirdly, they offered a plan of salvation for those people who would be then in distress because of their sins. We can't just set aside the scriptures. And why can't we just ignore it or, or cast it aside as unimportant or relevant? Th these great prophecies they just say they're just old, they're old myths, they're legends from the past. Well, we would say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the Bible has been verified again and again on every level, from generation after generation. And both internal and external evidence cements the truth of the details recorded in it. Wars have been waged over the Bible. Bible believers have suffered and to this day are persecuted for reading, printing or preaching from it in some countries. And we know some nations and monarchs still believe the Bible and stand by it. Others attempt to expunge and erase the Holy Scriptures. But sadly, most, most sadly of all, most neglect it and they don't bother to consult it at all. But God's chosen people, the Jews, Hebrews, the children of Israel as they're termed, whether they like it or not, are important witnesses of existence. I want you to come across with me to Isaiah, another prophet of the Jewish people in Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43 has many snapshots of, of hope for the people of Israel, and not only for the people of Israel, but also for the whole world. These are wonderful prophecies, and they are worth consulting. 
In Isaiah 43, and at verse, we'll start at verse 9. A call. This is a call from the Lord God of hosts, the, the God of heaven. He says, Let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say it is truth. And this is now, he turns to the, his own people, the people, the Jewish people. He says, ye, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no saviour. I have declared and have saved and have showed when there was no strange God among you, therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. So to summarise that, what's, what's happening here? So God is saying, assemble all the nations around here as though it was an international court of justice. And now I want you to present the evidence to justify your existence and your authority and your purpose. God says, the nation of Israel are my chosen servants and this is the proof of my existence that I am without beginning or end, that no one is greater than me. I have spoken, God says, saved and shown continuously despite your worship, Israel, of false gods that there is no other God beside me. And in those other verses he says, Jews are my witnesses because no one can overpower me. I work to a purpose and no one can block my purpose. Because I am the Holy One, Holy one the creator of Israel, the only one in the universe who can redeem you or subdue your enemies. I am your king. And of course, we have the nation of Israel before us in their own land, the state of Israel, as exact proof of this, that God is still in control. He is still their great king, still very much interested in the dust and the stones of that city, Jerusalem. So whose capital then is Jerusalem? The burning question. Well, while we're in Isaiah, let, let's back up to Isaiah chapter 2. Because here, as I said to you, is one of these great snapshots of, of blessing, not only for Israelis, but also for the whole world. And in Isaiah 2 and verse 1, we see that the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So this is the subject. He's going to talk about Judah, where the Jews come from, and, and Jerusalem. In verse 2 of Isaiah 2, he says, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now consider this wonderful prophecy that follows in verse 4, that will go, that's going to affect the whole world. He shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. A wonderful picture of the end to the arms race and the hostility and conflict that racks this globe. Now Isaiah was God's prophet to the Jewish nation and he prophesied around BC 649 through to about BC 588. And it was in the sunset days of Judah's commonwealth when Hezekiah was king in Jerusalem. And if we stack up the weight of biblical evidence that we've been already, in the, in the few passages that we've considered already, we can only rationally and logically conclude that the Lord God of heaven chooses Jerusalem to be his capital. So when are those last days? When's that? Is it a million years in the future? Is it past? 
No, those last days are right now, 2018 and beyond. They're right now, they're our days. So this prophecy in Isaiah 2 is telling us that the whole world, not just Jerusalem, the whole world will call Jerusalem their eternal capital. Now certainly, as Mr Netanyahu maintains, and the Jewish people behind him, that Jerusalem is their eternal capital. And their thirst for it while in diaspora, exiled into foreign lands, is recorded in Psalms and, and, and Psalm, Psalm 137 says, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. So the Jewish people have longed for that city and longed for their homeland because they have spent many, many thousands of years away from it. That was their home. They always looked that they might return from it. And oftentimes they were scattered and brought back. And now they've come back and they've re-established the state, the state of this state of Israel. But what about peace? Now peace will never come to Jerusalem via a wake of vultures vying and clamouring for Jerusalem as their own capital, their, their sacred site. And the members of the United Nations who speak against the state of Israel or who despise the Jewish race would be wise to take heed of Zechariah 12. Let's, let's go back to Zechariah and look at that. There's a lot bound up in this subject of Jerusalem, both physically and symbolically. And in Zechariah 12, and at verse 1, we read, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel... Seth the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. So yes, he is busy superintending the universe. But he's also very interested in Jerusalem. Behold, verse 2, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together pardon, against it. So all those who array themselves against God's purpose with Jerusalem will find that they have picked up a very very heavy stone that becomes impossible to carry with dire consequences. Now, Christadelphian Bible students, since their inception in about 1864, have always maintained a special affection and admiration for the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish people, the people of the Bible. And the story of the Jews is the story of an exodus from slavery in Egypt. It's a journey from persecution to freedom and it's a story that shows the power of faith and the promise of hope. Now, Australia's monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, her ambassadors and ministers of the Commonwealth, Australia's parliamentarians, a justice system, even defence personnel, all have turned to the wisdom of the Hebrew Bible for direction, for guidance and for inspiration. Even Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, is a close friend and ally of the Jewish people. And... To the Jewish people, the world does owe a great debt. The Jews have, through remarkable ingenuity, they've improved our health, our safety, our lifestyles here in Australia, right here in Brisbane. And throughout the ages, despite their unbelief in a crucified and resurrected Messiah, their meticulous scribes have safeguarded the accuracy of this book of books, the Hebrew Bible that we're reading from tonight. And there's prominent Jewish thinkers that are household names. People like Alfred Einstein, who after World War II was offered the presidency of the State of Israel, but, but he declined, it was probably a wise move. But he collaborated with Dr. Chaim Wiseman in establishing the Hebrew University of Jerusalem to foster learning and education. Karl Marx, you may know of him. He was a prophet of social revolution and a champion of the working class, and he gave the world, for better or for worse, the doctrine of communism. Some of us may know of Sigmund Freud, 
He was famous as the founder of psychoanalysis and the psychiatrist couch. But to stretch further back in history to Jewish names long since lost in the mists of time, we discover great mathematicians and rational, logical thinkers who developed the basis of trigonometry and improved the science of navigation for marine safety. So Jews have continued to excel on, on every level, delivering an enormous number of inventions and innovations that have taken root on its soil over the past 60 to 70 years despite challenges of geography, of size and diplomacy. And the ever-churning ever Israeli mind has brought us things like drip irrigation and the Intel computer chip and the USB key, surgical robots and radiation-free medical devices and the Hewlett-Packard digital printing press. Among, that's just a few things that they're famous for inventing and innovating. Now, the Jewish people may proudly assume that they are their own messiah, saving the world by their own prowess and ingenuity, or that they have somehow arrived at a position of success and prosperity by their own strength. But the Bible shows us just who is backing Jewish success and why. Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7. In Deuteronomy 7 is where we hear from Moses, the famous leader of the Exodus, where in Deuteronomy are recorded his last words to that nation before he died. And he reminded them not to forget their greatest benefactor and to always appreciate what the Lord God of heaven had done and would do for them. And in Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6, Moses says, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did set, not set his love upon you, nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Verse 10, and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him, he will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Pretty powerful words, isn't it? about not forgetting their backer, their benefactor, which was the Lord God of hosts. And he continued in Deuteronomy 8 and verse 11. He said, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then, and here's the danger, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God. Verse 17. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. And we know that the Israelis are very proud of their innovations and their inventions and their achievements. But, verse 18, thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. It's not your own ingenuity. He does this that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them and worship them, watch out. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroys before your face, so shall ye perish. Because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. A very, very sombre warning. And the Jews have suffered time and time again for their failure to be thankful to their benefactor, the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel. And through a 2,000 year period of exile, the longest of any people on the face of the earth, 
and though vanquished and expelled, suffering torture and massacres, the Jewish people held on to this promise that God would save them and bring them back to their own land again. Deuteronomy 30, if you come across there with me, we see that promise. And these are just several of many that speak of God's work with the people of Israel. In Deuteronomy 30 and verse 1, And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the utmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. And he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. I understand there's about six million Jews living in Jerusalem, uh, rather in Israel today. And when we talk about the Holocaust in which six million Jews perished, uh, perhaps some of you in this audience have travelled to Poland and visited the concentration camps and gas chambers constructed by Nazi Germany to dispose of all, they dis all those who they disdained. And these camps are chilling reminders of anti-Semitic hatred where, where six million Jewish men, women and children perished in the genocide of the Holocaust. And many marvel at the resolve and stamina of the Jewish people who just three years after walking in the shadow of death during the Second World War rose up from the ashes. In effect, a divine resurrection to begin to reclaim a Jewish future and to return and rebuild the Jewish state in their ancient homeland in direct fulfilment of Bible prophecy. And I received a photo from a family member who visited Auschwitz about several years ago and it showed jubilant young Israelis emerging from Auschwitz, this place of horror, this death camp, draped in an Israeli flag. And to my mind, when I see something like that, there is nothing more thrilling and hopeful. It proves conclusively the Bible to be true. The Jews would return to their land. You cannot crush the Jew. Despite your concentration camps, despite your programs, despite your massacres, your expulsions, because God, the creator of the universe, is their God. He is their benefactor and backer. Of course, the great thing is that we understand from the scriptures is that he can also be our benefactor too. But I believe we should marvel at an even higher level. We should be struck by the astonishing accuracy of God's prophetic word which predicted that these events would occur hundreds or even thousands of years before they happened. And in May this year, as the State of Israel celebrates the 70th anniversary of its birth, the Jewish people will mark the day when they begin to answer that ancient question posed by the prophet Isaiah. Now, Isaiah Isaiah 66, if you're taking notes, I'll just read from it for you. Verse 8 to 13. Who have heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth, says God, and not cause to bring forth? Shall I cause to bring forth and then shut the womb, saith thy God? No, rejoice ye with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all ye that mourn for her. He goes on in verse 12 to say, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I'll extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then shall ye suck, ye shall be born upon her sides, and be dandled upon her knees, as one whom his mother comforts, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. So it's not two states with two capitals in the one city, one for Jews, another for Palestinians. It's not the toleration and harmony of many faiths, each with their church, their synagogue or their mosque. And it's not American or European plans to stabilise the region by propping up various religious bodies with millions of dollars 
as a means to peace, because all these plans are doomed to fail. In fact, it's not even America or any other nation or even the Jews themselves who will chart the roadmap to peace or reinstate Jerusalem as their capital and gain universal acceptance and recognition. The Bible is very, very clear about this. Peace can only come to the Middle East. This peace that we've just read of in Isaiah that flows out from Jerusalem will only come on God's terms and in God's time. Now, there is a suggestion by some that trust and confidence can be a reality among the great nations who call these ancient lands home and that a remarkable transformation is taking place across the Middle East today with the dawn of a new era of co cooperation in our day and age. And they say that there's winds of change sweeping across the Middle East where long-standing enemies are becoming partners and old foes are finding new ground for cooperation and the descendants of Isaac and Ishmael, Jews and Arabs, are coming together in common causes never before. Now, uh, the American Vice President, Mr. Mr Mike Pence, he said in a recent speech while he was in the Israeli Parliament in Jerusalem, he said this. He said, as I stand in Abraham's land, and I quote, I believe that all who cherish freedom and seek a brighter future should cast their eyes here to this place, Jerusalem, and marvel at what they behold. How unlikely was Israel's birth? How more unlikely has been her survival? And how confounding and against the odds has been her thriving? The Jewish people have turned the desert into a garden, scarcity into plenty, sickness into health, and you turned hope into a future. Israel is like a tree that has grown deep roots in the soil of your forefathers, yet as it grows, it reaches ever closer to the heavens. And today and every day, the Jewish state of Israel and all the Jewish people bear witness to God's faithfulness as well as your own. It was the faith of the Jewish people, he says, that gathered the scattered fragments of a people and made them whole again, that took the language of the Bible and the landscape of the Psalms and made them live again. And it was faith that rebuilt the ruins of Jerusalem and made them strong again. The miracle of Israel is an inspiration to the world. And so we will pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that those who love you be secure, that there be peace within your walls and security in your citadels. And we will work and strive for that brighter future where everyone who calls this ancient land their home shall sit under the vine, their vine and fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. With an unshakable bond between our people and our shared commitment to freedom, I say from my heart, may God bless the Jewish people, may God bless the state of Israel and all who call these lands their home, unquote. Now, Christadelphians and astute Bible students likewise pray and sing about the peace of Jerusalem, as we've, as we've already sung in our opening hymn this evening. And, and for the they, we, we would say amen to Pence's sentiments on the miraculous revival of Israel and the association of the Jews with Jerusalem. And I believe that blessing Israel is something worth doing because of ancient promises made to Abraham, their forefather, by the Lord God of heaven, containing both blessings and a curse that are still in force and effective in these last days. There's Many terms of the promise made to Abraham, but I'll just read, read for you one of them from Genesis 12. I will bless them, says God, that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth shall be blessed. And so through the ages ever since, the fortunes of Israel's friends and adversaries wax and wane, all depending on their relationship with Israel, the people of the book, and based upon their understanding or their ignorance of the, Lord's God's, the Lord God's promises to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. Now God plans to resurrect these patriarchs and many thousands of faithful people from the dust to receive the gift of land and multitudes of descendants that he promised them as a reward for their faith. They would have children like the stars of heaven and the sand grains on the shore. So the Bible confirms by prophecy after prophecy that peace is not only possible, it's a certain eventuality. Jerusalem will be the accepted capital of the whole world. It will become a reality in the last days. But it will all hinge on peace coming to Israel first. Jerusalem's adversaries must first be subdued and it will only be in full compliance with God's terms for peace. 
And if you go through that prophecy of Zechariah, we only read a few passages this, this evening, but if you go through that prophecy, you'll see that the future king of the Jews is coming. He's going to bring peace to a very troubled region. And for all the adversaries and enemies, they'll be struck with blindness and with astonishment. And plagues and pandemonium will come upon those who fight against Jerusalem until ultimately Jerusalem is a city of peace. And in the last chapter of Zechariah, maybe if you just turn across there, Zechariah chapter 14, peace will ultimately come to Jerusalem. So much so that we're told in Zechariah 14 and verse 20 that in that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seed therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So it's talking about the things that will be in that in that place, in that house of God in Jerusalem, will all be holy, both the people and the instruments, and there'll be nothing to defile or to make it unclean. So ultimately, divided nations will become united families in the kingdom of God with Jerusalem as their capital. And Jerusalem will become a true holy city, not just in name, but also in, in nature. And certainly citizens of that future capital must comply with the conditions God sets out for both Jews and non-Jews. Psalm 15 says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. So will you see and experience this great event, ladies and gentlemen? When Jerusalem becomes the capital of the whole world, the centre for worldwide peace and disarmament will open, when happiness, blessing and joyfulness will spread to all families and peoples on the planet. It will come to you only if you and I personally and independently take action. What's the action? What do we need to do? To be saved eternally, we need to read the Holy Bible and trust the Lord God at his word. We need to respond to the gospel or good news of Christ the King and his worldwide kingdom with its capital in Jerusalem. And then we need to repent and to be baptised to wash away our sins. Jerusalem means peace, shalom, and will finally become synonymous with true and lasting peace. No longer a boiling pot of emotional and physical conflict, of endless bloodshed and division. Why? Because the King of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be enthroned there. He was born to be King, was crucified as King of the Jews, was resurrected to the right hand of his Father in Heaven, and he has promised to return to take up the throne of his ancestor King David, which will be reconstituted, re-established in Jerusalem forever. The whole world is in a mess, not just the Middle East. We need to choose to read the Bible to seek out its truth, believe it, and respond to God's instructions found nowhere else, only in the Bible, in order to comprehend his purpose with the nation of Israel and to live in hope of the fulfilment of his promises. May God bless you with an understanding of his word.